Hey, this is Dave DeCamp from Antiwar.com. This is Antiwar News for Wednesday, November 6th, 2024. All right, first thing, uh, our fundraiser is just about finished. We're trying to make a final push, just get a couple more thousand dollars to reach our goal. Uh, thank you to everyone who pitched in to help us out. Thank you for your generosity. This is how antiwar.com is able to continue. We are 100% funded by our readers. Um, so, if you, But if you haven't yet and you have the means, please go to antiwar.com slash donate to help us cross that finish line. All right, so it is election night as I'm recording this, uh, late Tuesday night. So that's what a lot of the news is focused on. But we have a lot of stuff, you know, going on around the world uh, to go over here. Uh, the first story at the top of antiwar.com, the big news from Tuesday, Netanyahu fires Defense Minister Gallant. So on Tuesday, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced that he fired Defense Minister Yoav Gallant who was recently calling for Israel to make painful concessions to reach a hostage deal with Hamas. So Netanyahu's office put out a statement that said, quote, Unfortunately, over the past months, the trust between me and the Minister of Defense has been broken. There were significant gaps regarding the management of the military campaign, and these gaps were accompanied by statements and actions that contradicted the decisions of the government and of the cabinet, end quote. Gallant is set to be replaced by Israeli Foreign Minister Israel Katz and Gideon Saar as a former Netanyahu rival who recently joined the government. He joined the government after Netanyahu dramatically escalated things in Lebanon in September. Um, so he was happy with that. So he, he joined the coalition and now he is going to be the foreign minister. So Netanyahu's decision to fire Gallant was slammed by the Hostages and Missing Families Forum, which represents relatives of Israeli hostages in Gaza. The group said that the firing was part of Netanyahu's efforts to torpedo any chances of a hostage deal with Hamas. So the hostage families weren't happy with this move. Who was happy with it? Uh, Itamar Ben-Gavir, the national security uh, minister. He said... Um, he's very happy and, and, you know, everybody at this point knows who Ben Gavir is. He is a settler, you know, openly in favor of annexation of Gaza, of the ethnic cleansing of Gaza, wants the annexation of the West Bank, wants Palestinian prisoners to be executed, to make rooms in prisons. He's called for Israeli border guards to shoot Palestinian women and children in the head. This is who's happy with this move by Netanyahu. He said, quote, I congratulate the prime minister on the decision to dismiss Gallant. With Gallant, who is still deeply trapped in his own conception, it is impossible to achieve a complete victory, end quote. So Israeli opposition parties responded by calling for protests against Netanyahu, and thousands of demonstrators took to the streets of Tel Aviv on Tuesday night to block traffic and light fires. So... Netanyahu and Gallant have been at odds over much of the past year. In August, Gallant called Netanyahu's goal of total victory in Gaza nonsense. Um, Gallant has been repeatedly calling for a deal with Hamas to free some hostages, but he has also made clear that he only wanted a temporary ceasefire and did not actually want to end the genocidal war. This is Gallant that we're talking about. I believe, I, I think I saw Caitlin Johnstone refer to him as Yoav, human animals, Gallant. And that's because his quote at the beginning of this thing is often cited, you know, it's kind of one of the most frequently cited as evidence of genocidal intent. On October 9th, 2023, he announced a complete siege on Gaza and said that Israel was fighting human animals. So what is... uh Gallant's replacement have to say around the same time Katz said a pretty similar thing call, you know it's basically saying that they're cutting off everything to starve out the Palestinians um, this was a few days I believe or early October 2023 a quote from Katz here that I saw going around he said quote humanitarian aid to Gaza 
No electrical switch will be turned on, no water hydrant will be opened, and no fuel truck will enter until the Israeli abductees are returned home. Humanitarianism for humanitarianism, and no one will preach us morality, end quote. Um, so, you know, this is uh, another thing about Gallant that I didn't really mention in the story here is that he's been the preferred member of the Israeli government to talk to of the U.S., of the Biden administration. They view him as some sort of moderating force, even though, again, this is Yoav, human animals, Gallant we're talking about here. Um, and he was also very hawkish on Lebanon, always threatening to turn Lebanon into Gaza, which we see Israel is doing now. You know, he was saying, if there's a ceasefire in Gaza, we're going to escalate in Lebanon. At one point, he did start to say that they weren't ready for war with Lebanon because of just the state of the military. Again, it's not like he's some humanitarian who wants to end the war or end the violence. He's just more practical, it seems, than Netanyahu. Um so he's been pushed out, and Netanyahu decided to do this on election day. Uh, I think there was a reason for that, and that was because the Biden administration, uh, you know, there was one point when Gallant went to visit the U.S. Uh, and apparently didn't inform Netanyahu. You know, things like that uh, had happened. All right, so the next one here, Israeli strike on home in North Gaza kills 25, including 13 children. So an Israeli strike on a home in Bet Lahia, northern Gaza, killed at least 25 Palestinians, including 13 children. This was reported by the Palestinian news agency Wafa. Medical sources said that people are still missing under the rubble, meaning that the death toll could rise. Dr. Hussam Abu Safia, who we've been hearing from him a lot lately, he's the director of the nearby Kamal Adwan Hospital that has come under repeated Israeli attacks. He said the home that was targeted was sheltering several displaced Palestinian families. According to the Associated Press, Israel claimed that it targeted a weapons storage facility, but as usual, offered no evidence for the claim. Bet Lahia has been under a total Israeli siege since the beginning of October, as Israeli forces are attempting to carry out an ethnic cleansing campaign known as the General's Plan. The assault has been focused on Bet Lahia and the neighboring cities of Jabalia and Bet Hanun. Um, these are the places where they've completely put it under siege. You see this picture here. These are some of the Palestinians who fled Bet Lahia on Tuesday, and it's women and children. One of these uh, looks like one of the children in this picture here was wounded. Uh, it looks like he's missing a leg. He's in a wheelchair. This is who. Uh, this is a war against these people. These are the ones who are being ethnically cleansed, being killed, being starved, um, and dozens of Palestinians, mostly women and children, fled Bet Lahia on Tuesday. This was reported by AP. They spoke with one of them, an elderly Palestinian woman named Huda Abu Laila. She said, "Quote: We came barefoot. We have no sandals, no clothes, nothing." We have no money. There is no food or drink. We are hungry. Hunger has killed us. We were under siege for one month without water or food, end quote. Medical sources told Al Jazeera that Israeli attacks across Gaza on Tuesday had killed at least 54 Palestinians since dawn, including 39 who were killed in the north. Gaza's health ministry said about midday that at least 17 Palestinians were killed in the previous 24 hours. As we know, the health ministry, uh, they count bodies and wounded Palestinians who show up at hospitals and morgues in northern Gaza. The hospitals are, uh, there's, they're not functioning. The Kamal Adwan Hospital is barely functioning. Um, the civil defense has broken down. The rescue operations have broken down. So many of the dead are not being counted by the health ministry. Um, and that was the case already. Um, and so their death toll right now is 43,391. Um but again, that's a that's an undercount. Uh, and as we've been talking about the American healthcare workers, including Dr. Sidwa, who I recently interviewed, they estimated that at least 118,000 Palestinians have been killed. That includes indirect deaths such as starvation. And, the, and he said in the interview with me that that was the bare minimum estimate based on the data that they looked at. And that is over 5% of the population. So the slaughter continues in Gaza. Um, the next one here, LA Times owner cites Gaza as reason not to endorse candidate. This article is from 
uh, Ryan Grimm at Dropsite News. So this is interesting. Patrick Soon Shang, he's a billionaire. Medical technology uh, is his field. Uh, he's the owner of the LA Times. And so they didn't endorse a candidate, the, uh, a presidential candidate. You know, they're expected to endorse Harris. Um, his daughter came out and put out the statement saying they didn't endorse her because of Gaza, because of the Gaza genocide. The paper uh, kind of countered that and said, no, that's not true. She doesn't speak for us. Um, but uh, Ryan Grimm got an email that he sent, uh, an internal email, where he cites Gaza as one of the reasons. Um, so he said in this email, quote, has there ever been a time in our history when our nation is knowingly providing arms to another nation using those weapons to kill children, women, innocent people, and target the press, doctors, and medical workers? And policies enabling this are supported, it seems, by both candidates. We can and must acknowledge concerns for democracy, uh, January 6th and the horrific October Hamas attacks, but how do we ignore the counter issues of the innocents being killed now? Do we accept that indeed genocide is happening and that we stand as a country of willing arms suppliers and yet remain silent, end quote? Um, so again, when they said that they chose not to endorse a candidate, the paper didn't actually say that, but it's clear that Gaza is one, one reason why here. Uh, all right, so the next one here, I kept up the interview from with Dr. Sidwa, just trying to get more eyes on that. Um, the next one, the U.S. warns Iraq not to allow attack on Israel. The Biden administration has warned the Iraqi government that if it allows Iran to attack Israel from its soil, the U.S. will not stop Israel from striking Iraq. This was reported by Axios on Tuesday. The report said U.S. and Israeli intelligence believe that Iran is preparing to launch a significant attack from Iraq in response to Israel's October 26th airstrikes on Iran, which killed four Iranian soldiers and one civilian. Iranian officials have been vowing that there will be a response. U.S. and Israeli officials claim that the IRGC has been moving drones and ballistic missiles to the Shia militias in Iraq in preparation for a joint attack. The Axios report said National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and Secretary of State Antony Blinken both spoke with Iraqi Prime Minister Mohammed Shia al-Sudani this week and warned him not to allow Iran to attack from Iraqi territory. A U.S. official said, quote, if you don't, we won't be able to stop Israel from striking Iraq, end quote. Um, so this could turn into Israel and Iran going to war in Iraq and Iraq taking all the the really heavy hits. Um, the uh, the U.S. is vowing to defend Israel from any potential attack and has deployed all these military assets, including the B-52 bombers, which were a threat to Iran. Um, we've been covering this stuff a lot. And, you know, Iranian officials, when this attack first happened, when Israel bombed Iran, you know, they downplayed it initially, but then kind of it seemed like slowly the rhetoric from the Iranians kind of sharpened and now they're saying it's inevitable. There's going to be a big attack. So we'll we'll see. We'll see what happens. We'll see who wins tonight. You know, I mean, it's it's gonna. Uh, I think that could change things and how the U.S. is going to operate in this. I mean, how the U.S. is going to operate in this is clear that they're just going to back Israel no matter what. But I don't know. Maybe thing things could be different. <clears throat> uh, you know, in a lame duck Biden administration. I guess Biden's been a lame duck for a while now, though. Uh, all right, so the next one here, uh, the U.S. says it was involved in 95 anti-ISIS operations in 60 days. So U.S. Central Command said in a press release on Monday that its forces were involved in 95 operations against ISIS in Iraq and Syria since August 29th. Some of the operations were conducted with Iraqi government forces in Iraq and Kurdish-led forces in Syria. The U.S. also conducted several rounds of unilateral airstrikes in Syria. CENTCOM claimed that the operations killed a total of 163 what they called terrorists. You know, there's no real accountability for this. There's very few eyes on what the U.S. military is actually doing in these raids and airstrikes. Um, and they said that they captured 33. Um, so there have been U.S. casualties in these operations as well, although no U.S. troops have been killed. In October, two U.S. military personnel were wounded in a raid in Iraq 
And on October 29th, seven Americans were hurt in an attack on ISIS hideouts in Iraq. So this is nearly 100 U.S. military operations in just two months. And from tracking this stuff, this is a lot. Um, So this is increasing. And I just had to mention in the article that many of these nearly 100 U.S. military operations came after Vice President Kamala Harris said at the debate with Trump that no U.S. troops are deployed in combat zones, just a flat-out lie. And we also saw Biden claim, I think it was in July, you know, saying that the U.S. was not at war anywhere. And then that same night, the U.S. bombed Yemen. I mean, just a complete joke. Um, And then the real frustrating thing about this is that the governments of Iraq and the governments of Syria, they don't want the U.S.'s help in this fight against ISIS. Obviously, the Syrian government doesn't. The U.S. is occupying um, Syrian territory, which is opposed by the government in Damascus. They back the Kurds there, so that allows the U.S. to control a good good portion of territory so that the U.S. allies there are the, the SDF, the Kurds. In Iraq, the U.S. is still conducting operations with the Iraqi government, but uh, al-Sudani, the prime minister, has repeatedly said over the past year, we don't need help fighting ISIS. We can handle it. You guys can go. Um And, of course, the U.S. doesn't want to go, so they negotiated this deal where they're going to end the U.S.-led anti-ISIS coalition, but the U.S. isn't actually going to withdraw from Iraq. And this is just such a tripwire for war, especially now. The possibility of Iran launching a big attack from Iraq, Israel hitting Iraq hard. Those U.S. bases in Iraq and Syria, they're going to come under very heavy attack if this thing escalates and you know, uh, if if Iran decides to use its ballistic missiles against those U.S. bases, there's going to be a lot of American uh, casualties. So it's just so uh, foolish to keep troops in these places where they're just, you know, sitting ducks, basically trip wires for war, which might be the, the purpose of keeping them there anyway. Uh, all right. So the next one here. Uh, Israeli teams raise entire villages in Lebanon. This article is from Brett Wilkins. So um, we've covered this a bit, the Israeli troops, you know, just destroying whole villages in southern Lebanon. Um, There's just been a lot more, you know, there's been a lot coming out about it. So as the death toll from Israel's uh, 13-month assault on Lebanon past 3,000, satellite imagery analysis published by multiple media outlets in recent days revealed that nearly a quarter of all buildings in 25 municipalities in the southern part of Lebanon have been destroyed or damaged in a ferocious campaign that has left entire villages in ruins. Um, Satellite photos examined by the Washington Post, Reuters, and the Financial Times showed vast destruction caused by Israeli bombings and controlled demolitions of towns and villages, many of whose residents are among the more than 1.2 million people who have been forcibly displaced. Um, there's some quotes here from people who live in these areas saying everything's been reduced to rubble. Um, so this is Mais al-Jabal, a border village. Um, uh, and you could see the explosion here. I mean, it is absolutely, uh, massive. This is controlled demolition in this area. Just boom. I mean, look at that. Uh, so you know, there, there are the fears of uh, Lebanon, sorry, Israel trying to create a buffer zone in Lebanon. Um, at the same time, Israel has also had trouble. They haven't been able to actually capture much territory, but they have control of, you know, some of these small villages and, and look what they're doing. They're just completely uh, destroying the place. <clears throat> um, all right. So the next one here, Israel launches new attacks on West Syrian city of Qusair. This article is from Jason Ditz. Israeli airstrikes against targets in Syria are becoming an almost daily occurrence with another round of airstrikes reported on Tuesday in the city of Qusair. Qusair. It's uh, Q-U-S-A-Y-R. And it's along the border with Lebanon. Uh, The outskirts of the city came under attack on Friday, killing 10 people, mostly civilians. Uh, The attack on Tuesday targeted an industrial zone along with some residential buildings. The health director of the Homs province said that there were no casualties in the latest attacks. Exactly what was hit isn't entirely clear, but locals reported that a lot of infrastructure was damaged. Israel offered comments on today's attack, calling it an intelligence-based strike against Hezbollah weapon storage facilities 
Um, despite the claims, it's not clear that, that what was hit was actually a weapons depot. There's no reports of secondary explosions or anything like that. No word on any casualties or anything yet. But again, it seems like they're bombing Syria now uh, every day. Uh, all right, the next one here. At least seven killed in Israeli raid on uh, and airstrikes on the West Bank. This article is from the New Arab. I've been kind of neglecting the West Bank lately. There's been a lot going on. Um, At least seven people were killed on Tuesday during an Israeli military raid and airstrikes on the occupied West Bank, the Palestinian health ministry said. Five of the seven people were killed in two separate Israeli attacks in and near the city of Kabatiya, while the two others were killed in the Tamun area, the ministry said. The Israeli military claimed that its aircraft had targeted a group of gunmen and that its forces had arrested 60 militants. The Islamic Jihad's armed wing, Al-Quds Brigade, said its fighters had clashed with Israeli forces in both areas. An Al-Arabi TV cameraman was reportedly wounded by Israeli gunfire on one of the cities. Governor of the nearby city of Tubis, whose jurisdiction includes Tamun, confirmed that two people had been killed there too. I said that someone was killed by an airstrike. Their body was torn to pieces. Another 15 Palestinians were arrested in different parts of the West Bank by Israeli forces. So things have stepped up in the West Bank. And uh, Katz, Israel Katz, who's becoming the defense minister now, uh, he, when they started really ramping things up in the West Bank, they launched some pretty significant raids in uh, targeting Janine and other northern areas. You know, he said, we're going to do in the West Bank what we're doing in Gaza Um, And I think, and they destroyed a lot of infrastructure in those cities. So um, I think there's always a chance of seeing things really ramp up again in the West Bank. All right. So the next one here, Ukraine claims that it fired on North Korean troops. So Ukrainian Defense Minister Rustem Umarov claimed on Tuesday that Ukrainian forces had engaged with North Korean troops in Russia's Kursk Oblast for the first time. A day earlier, another Ukrainian official made a similar claim, saying that Ukrainian forces fired artillery at North Korean troops. Uh, The Pentagon said that it could not corroborate these claims. Pentagon spokesman Major General Pat Ryder said, quote, We've seen the press reports about alleged combat ops. We're looking into those, but at this point cannot corroborate those reports. End quote. So Russian officials have not confirmed the presence of North Korean troops on Russian territory, but they haven't denied the allegations, and they've pointed to this new military agreement between Pyongyang and Moscow that was signed earlier this year, which includes a mutual defense clause. Putin basically can, you know, indirectly confirm that there are North Korean troops in Russia. This is a map from south front of the Kursk Oblast, uh, the military situation there. Um, This is what the... uh, where Ukraine invaded back in August, and Russia has been kind of slowly pushing them out. Um, And the U.S. has said that it believes there is about 10,000 North Korean troops in Kursk. Um, And I mentioned how Zelensky has been lashing out at his Western backers over what he says is a lack of action over the North Korean troops. He wants NATO missiles to, to hit them, you know, deep inside Russia, which, of course risks you know this that that would be a major escalation it's just things are really uh he's he's really just asking for a lot there's no sign that the u.s is gonna give him these long-range strikes with the nato missiles but again after the election you know things could change the way that the biden administration is operating right now it seemed like they're just dumping weapons in there to get to the election they certainly did not want to start talks before the election because this is biden's war this is biden's legacy same thing with gaza but ukraine i mean this has uh been going on for longer and this was their big moment to shine you know biden and jake sullivan and anthony blinken and to act like they were these the leaders of the the rules-based international order which has all been exposed in gaza of course but you know this is what they're going to be remembered for that that crew uh is all these disasters. All right, so the next one here, Biden seeks a bilateral deal with Saudi Arabia. This one is from Kyle Anzalone at the Libertarian Institute. Before President Joe Biden leaves office in January, he will seek to sign a bilateral security agreement with Saudi Arabia, according to a new report. 
The deal comes after the Biden administration failed to ink a normalization agreement between Israel and Saudi Arabia. That was the big goal for the Middle East. That was what Brett McGurk wanted his legacy to be was the Israel-Saudi normalization, but not going to happen. And uh, so the Saudi had the Saudis had a big ask from the U.S. for that Israel-Saudi normalization, and it was making some progress before October seventh. The Saudis want a mutual defense treaty with the U.S. They want the U.S. to commit to going to war for them. That's not what they're going to get now if they do a bilateral deal. Um, it might be similar to what they recently did to the UAE, which they designated them. Um, I think it was the UAE that they recently designated them as a non-NATO ally, and that basically gives them access to more weapons, um, You know, makes it easier to, you know, cooperate militarily in certain areas. So I think we might see something like that. I don't think we would see the mutual defense treaty that um, that Saudi Arabia actually wants. Um, so they're just looking to, I think, score some kind of th- something that they could say is a, is a win. I, I don't really know what the benefit is here. I think part of the thinking is get the Saudis, try to keep the Saudis in their corner because they've been friendly with Iran since they've normalized relations. They just did some military drills with Iran. They don't want them to drift too far in that direction. I think that's probably part of the thinking here. All right, so the last story here, the U.S. Air Force's election night ICBM test. This article is from Consortium News by Leigh Yonatan, um, originally published at Common Dreams, actually, but... um, So this was uh, the U.S. has a missile launch plan for election night. Much of the significance will happen at the end of the election day, and a countdown will begin at 11 p.m. PDT on Tuesday. While everyone's attention will be on the next U.S. president, uh, the U.S. Air Force will test launch an intercontinental ballistic missile with a dummy hydrogen bomb on the tip um, from the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. The missile will cross the Pacific Ocean and 22 minutes later crash into the Marshall Islands. The U.S. Air Force does this several times a year. The launches are always at night while Americans are sleeping. Um, And she gets into some stuff about uh, saying, you know, this is what nightmares are made of. You know, these weapons, these ICBMs. Imagine, you know, the fact that it can go from California to the Marshall Islands in 22 minutes. Uh, You know, a missile capable of carrying a nuclear warhead that is very scary um and the u.s does do these tests it seems like every few months and this is the minutemen three that they're going to be testing here i'm not sure if it's happened yet um oh she said 11 p.m uh pacific time so not yet as of this recording uh so that is it for the news for today please go check out our viewpoints one from haretz the editorial board if it looks like ethnic cleansing it probably is we actually ran that in the news section a few days ago because that's an israeli newspaper saying yeah they're doing ethnic cleansing in northern gaza one from rep john duncan jr some of our leaders put other countries first one from thomas knapp how biden could save lives and change american politics on his way out the door One from Dominic Sanson, the U.S. is playing nuclear chicken in Ukraine. And one from Kelly Vlahos at Responsible Statecraft. Ukraine war well beyond who wins the election. So please go check all of that out. Um, Check out our blog. Got some good stuff over there. A lot of stuff on the lower portion of the page. Help us with our fundraiser if you can. Antiwar.com slash donate to give us that final little push. If if people want to know who I voted for, I ended up writing in uh, Thomas Massey and I explained my reasoning on Twitter was because I wanted to vote for a Republican who was not controlled by AIPAC. Um, I, uh, that's what I ended up doing. I wasn't sure even when I walked in who, what I was going to do. So I just wrote him in. Um, but we'll see right now I'm recording this late Tuesday night. I mean, I see that it, it looks like, uh, Trump, uh, is more likely to win at this time, but, you know, thing, things could change. And uh, yeah, so um, support this show, share it, like, subscribe, tell your friends, comment, all that stuff helps out. Uh, I will be back tomorrow with some more news. Thanks for listening.